to a new video from Jörg, Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth. This evening, again, I'm gathered via Skype with my brother in Christ, Tom Fress, over the United States of America, from Inquisition Update, and we have gathered here together to come to you with the seventh reading of uh, showing to you, as it is called, the New Testament confirms Daniel's 70th week prophecy. We are going to study New Testament verses, most of the time, not always, also Old Testament, but most of the time New Testament verses to show you that Jesus Christ was the absolute and total fulfillment of Daniel's 70-week prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Welcome to the broadcast, Tom. Yes, thank you, Yerk. It's nice to be here, and I'm blessed and privileged, and uh, I want to, to uh, convey to your listeners that... Uh, uh, if the New Testament confirms for us that the 70th week of Daniel is perfectly and completely fulfilled, then there is no future 70th week of Daniel. That's critical that we understand this. I don't want the listeners to miss this point. If we can show the listeners, and we can in spades, we can show the listeners that everything written in Daniel's prophecy was perfectly and completely fulfilled during uh, the ministry, the seven-year ministry from Jesus' baptism until the going forth of the command, uh, the going forth of the gospel to the Gentiles, that every portion, every part of that 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy was perfectly and completely fulfilled. There's nothing left to be fulfilled in the future. So therefore, there is no future fulfillment. There's no future seven-year period of time, whether they call it the Great Tribulation or no matter what they call it, there's no such thing. Now, I'm, I don't deny that there's Great Tribulation coming in this world for God's people. Don't get me wrong. And you may rightly call it the Great Tribulation, but it's not going to be limited to seven-year period of time. That seven-year period of time was historically fulfilled 2,000 years ago in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ the first three and a half years. And from that point, by the Holy Spirit-filled apostles until the end of the last three and a half years, when the, when the gospel went to the Gentiles. And if Yerk and I can prove that from the scriptures, you must relinquish your belief in a future 70th week of Daniel and everything that you've been taught in the churches about that future 70th week, because it's all a lie. 
Back to you, Jörg. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> Tom, the, the point is that the futurist teaching of uh, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, as he rightfully says, uh, declares the 70th week to be fulfilled by the Antichrist. That's their futurist teaching. Uh, the point is, if that seven years ministry of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago was a tribulation, as they teach, is a tribulation of the Antichrist in the end times, if it, <coughs> sorry, if it was a tribulation at those times, it was a tribulation for Satan, because Jesus Christ was declaring the kingdom of God on earth. That's right. It was his tribulation, and now he just turns it around, sneaky That's as he is, and puts it in the end time and says, no, I'm going to have my tribulation. That's an interesting observation. I'm, I'm very impressed with that observation, as I am. We are going to light the fire beneath Satan a little bit more, that he feels a little bit hotter when he is down there, um, we are going to read Daniel verse 26 from chapter 9 to go into our study today. But before that, just because I was busy uh, <laughs> mentioning Satan, I just can't, when I think of Satan, I always think of the Jesuits. And uh, today I, um, uh, I received a few books from Brother Brett, who sent me a package of that. And uh, I also wanted to upload the Jesuit oath on my archive org, uh, on my archive library there that I have there, because I translated the oath of the Jesuits in German. And there, of course, I found, yeah, it, it has to be found somewhere, because many people say this is a hoax. But when you go to the internet, you find the Jesuit oath also named in a book uh, written in 1837, as you can see here, by uh, Charles Didier in French, which is called Rome Souterrain, which means in English the sub, uh, subterranean Rome. And uh, I got the PDF in French. This is right here, a 351-page book. And I'm now very much looking for this book to find it in English. Uh, I'd very much love to have an original copy in, in my hands, so to buy one. And if that is not possible, to even get a PDF. So I just want to use these few seconds before we go into our reading uh, of uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, to ask our listeners if anybody has found this book or finds this book to give me or Tom a sign. We are very interested in buying this book, Rome Souterrain, by Charles Didier, which is the English title, Subterranean Rome. Yeah? It was translated, by our knowledge, in 1843 into the English language, but I looked today and I didn't find it in English, and that's why I'm asking this. And Tom and I, we both would be very grateful if someone could put us in the direction to get that book. Preferably as a physical book, but also a digital copy, of course, would be appreciated so that we can... Uh, tell the people who like to preach, oh, the Jesuit oath of induction is a hoax, to show them, no, it's in this book, and look, it's here, because we got the pages. And um, that's just a little um, appeal I wanted to make to our listeners, Tom, I hope with your uh, content, with, with your... Um, uh, yes, absolutely, I concur. I'd love to have a copy of that book, Subterranean Rome by Charles Didier. Good. Let's go into Daniel chapter 9. This is from the AV 1611 King James Version. You see that on the very quote-unquote archaic English, which I, by the way, who am not an English native speaker, absolutely love. It says in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the, other, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. That is the original text that we have from Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. So, what we have to understand is, Messiah, Jesus of course, was cut off, at 69 and a half weeks in 30 AD after three and a half years of ministry. Because 
when you have the 69th week fulfilled, the 70th week starts. And when the 70 weeks are full, the 70th week is completed. So that is the first three and a half years after the 69th week has been completed is the beginning of the 70th week. And that was reached in 30 AD, three and a half years of his ministry. Then he was cut off. That's what the text says. Now, what does the Bible say? Well, first we go into the Old Testament. We go into the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, uh, 53, verse 8. You have to understand, chapter 53 of Isaiah is a very important chapter. It is called, when you do a search of that on YouTube, for example, it is called the Forgotten Chapter. It is forgotten because it was forgotten to teach the Jews who studied the Old Testament, but here and there something was left out. For the Jews of old times and even many times today of the Jews of today, many things are taken off in their teachings. That means that their rabbis just don't teach them this part of the Bible. Oh, it is not important. Uh, we have nothing to do with it. And that doesn't refer to Jesus Christ. And I don't know what all they say. But Isaiah 58 verse, uh, 53 verse 8 deals with Jesus Christ. And uh, Isaiah 53, I think, has 12 or 13 verses, of which about 10 verses have a prophetic meaning for our Messiah, Jesus Christ, when he comes the very first time. So we read here in Isaiah 53 verse 8, quote, He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. What did we just read in verse 26? And after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off here, but not for himself. He shall be cut off, but not for himself. What does Isaiah say? that was written before the book of Daniel, he was cut off out of the land of the living. For what? Daniel says, sorry, Daniel says, not for himself, and Isaiah says, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. That is not for himself, right? He was stricken, he was cut off, not for himself, but for somebody else. Tom, would you venture a comment here? Absolutely, yes. He was, uh, he was the sacrificial lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He was sinless, without spot or blemish, just like the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He was the fulfillment of... Uh, all that God had predicted and prophesied about Messiah that was visibly shown and witnessed by every Hebrew when they offered a spotless lamb upon the altar and, conf and laid their hand upon the head of that lamb and confessed their sins and then offered the lamb to the priest for sacrifice. Jesus fulfilled it all. Every animal sacrifice that took place prior to Christ's uh, substitutional sacrifice on the altar was looking forward to that day when Jesus would offer himself a sacrifice. And uh, he didn't die for his own sins because he didn't sin. He was a spotless, perfect, uh, sinless lamb offered, whose blood was shed for the remission of our sins. We are the ones who have transgressed. We are his people. And it is his blood that washes our sins away. And uh, it was prophesied in the book of Isaiah, and it was fulfilled in the New Testament during the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. And I want to go back to what we said before. Remember, there were 70 weeks of years prophesied to Daniel by the angel Gabriel. And those 70 weeks of years were broken up into three separate time periods, 
first a period of seven weeks of years or 49 literal years, calendar years, and then 62 weeks came immediately without a gap right after the, the, the 49th year or the seventh year previously prophesied, 62 weeks, which is 434 years, all together equaling 69 weeks, 483 years. Okay? So what's left of the, of the 70 weeks? You have seven weeks and 62 weeks, which makes 69 weeks. How many weeks are left of the 70th week? of 70 weeks, only one week, one week of years, seven year period of time. And it says, and the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. That ladies and gentlemen is proof positive from the scriptures. You can't have it any other way that in the midst of the 70th and final week, the week, to total altogether 70 weeks. It says in the midst of the week, Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Now, look, uh, you, you, you have to concede that the 70th week, at least up until halfway through the 70th week, has been completed by Jesus 2,000 years ago. And it just so happens that from that midst of the week when Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, thus opening forever and uh, forever, once and for all, opening the Holy of Holies. There was only three and a half years left of that prophecy, remembering that the prophecy was for the Jews and for Jerusalem. The, the spirit-filled apostles continue to confirm the covenant in Christ's blood, the everlasting kingdom of Christ to the Jews and Jerusalem for three and a half years when the Sanhedrin officially rejected the gospel, stoned Stephen, and the gospel went then unto the Gentiles. Jesus said, go ye not into the way of the Gentiles. Okay. Why? It never made sense to me until I understood the perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. There was a specific reason why Jesus did not want the, the gospel to go to the Gentiles until Daniel's 70th week was finished. Not until the end of Daniel's prophecy. Not until the end of the 70th week, not until the end of the 490th year was the gospel to go to the Gentiles. And that is precisely what is recorded in the New Testament. Not one error can be found in the New Testament in the historical recollection, the historical writing of the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. That's why we're here today. That's why Yerk and I are here today to prove to you beyond any argument, any shadow of doubt that the 70th week of Daniel is over. It was for 70 weeks of years, exactly 490 years, 70 times seven equals 490. First, there were seven weeks of years then 62 weeks of years, which makes altogether 69 weeks of years, and then one week of years remaining. In the midst of that final week, Daniel says, the, 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 the sacrifices and oblations shall cease. And uh, there is absolutely going to be no sanction from heaven that there ever be another temple built on Temple Mount in Jerusalem so that the Jews can make animal sacrifices again. Never will God sanction another Jewish temple. And you must comprehend that unless God has another purpose for the modern nation state of Israel, 
that I don't fully comprehend yet, there's no justification in the scripture for the modern nation state of Israel that was established in 1948. Okay? There's absolutely no scriptural sanction <clears throat> for the establishment of a Sanhedrin, which there is today. There's absolutely no scriptural justification for a system of priests in Israel today to make animal sacrifices. There's no call for the search for the so-called Ark of the Covenant. There is no scriptural demand for the seeking of the ashes of the red heifer. There is no scriptural demand for the return of the Jews to the land which the world calls Palestine today. Unless you want to fulfill a phony counterfeit refulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. And that's what all the churches called Christian in the world today are doing. Refulfilling a counterfeit 70th week of Daniel. The Vatican, the papacy, together with all the kings of the earth, have done whatever it takes to persecute the Jews wherever they are and to create a modern nation state of Israel without the sanction of God and then to persecute the Jews until they seek to go back to that homeland for a hope of peace and safety, which they've never had since their existence in 1948. And do you know what it took? Do you know what it took to drive the Jews back down into that land? You see, the Jews aren't as forgetful as us Gentiles. They remember what it took to get them out of, uh, out of Egypt and into the Holy Land. They remember that. It was by the visible right hand of Almighty God. It took a plague upon uh, Egypt, repeated plagues upon Egypt to force them to let my people go. It took God blowing with his nostrils the whole night over the, over the, over the uh, Red Sea to make it part so that the Jews could cross on dry land. It took a very visible act of Almighty God to cause the walls of water that stood on both sides to collapse upon the, the Egyptian army as they pursued them to the other side. It took the visible act of Almighty God to water them, to feed them, to light the darkness by the glory of Almighty God, to feed them quail, to give to them the law, you know the story. Look what it took to get the Jews to their own uh, ancient homeland. Was there anything like that in 1948? Was there anything like that in 1948? Therefore, we must conclude that God wasn't a part of it. That was all man-made. And the only reason they want to do this return of the Jews to the so-called Holy Land is to cause the Jews to eat and drink damnation to themselves in a future 70th week of Daniel, lead the whole world astray, and, and answer the final Jewish question, to get them once again by their actions to make animal sacrifice and therefore reject the lamb that God provided for them. And now, horror of horrors, comprehend this, that every church in this country called Christian preaches this nonsense. Christians all over this country and all over the world scrape together as much money as they can to give to the Israelites so they could eat and drink damnation to themselves in a land that God never gave to them. <clears throat> God has not brought them back to this land. Man has. The man of sin has. The papacy has, with the help of the kings of the earth, 
That's the only conclusion you can draw from all of this. And yet, even after telling this truth, people accuse me of hating the Jews. I'm here to tell you I'm like Paul. I'd give up my own salvation for the salvation of the Jews if the Jews would only receive their Messiah. The problems of this world would go away. But Rome won't have it. Rome won't have it until the papacy is crowned king of all. And that's what the modern nation state of Israel is designed to do. The man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist has every hope in the world of succeeding in putting forward to the world a phony Antichrist will sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews and then in the midst of that week of years cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. At that point, everyone who calls himself a Christian will be convinced that that is the man of sin, the Antichrist. And it might as well be Mickey Mouse. Uh, they'll all believe that Mickey Mouse is the Antichrist. If he signs a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews and after three and a half years causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease, you won't be able to convince them otherwise but that he is the man of sin. And that will leave the papacy completely out of suspicion of being the Antichrist. But let me tell you, every Christian prior to about 1805 A.D. knew and testified, even at the cost of their own blood, their own property, their own children, their very lives, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. The the, the dirt of this earth is soaked with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus who were bled out and died at the hands of the papacy for merely saying the truth, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, the antichrist. Fox's Book of Martyrs was written to commemorate all those who insisted on pain of death that the papacy is, was, and always will be the man of sin, the son of perdition. But you can hardly find a Christian today who can tell you who the Antichrist is. If you walk into a Christian church, any number of Christian churches, and ask the whole congregation at a glance, who's the Antichrist, you'll get 50,000 different answers, and not a one of them will be right. Why? Because they always believe in a future Antichrist. They never believe in the historical one. Your churches are deceiving you with the greatest of deceptions. And thank God for someone like Steve Wolberg and others who, who write books to tell us the truth. And this book is one of them that shows you the very scriptures in the New Testament that prove to anyone beyond any shadow of doubt, any question, any suspicion, that Jesus fulfilled Daniel's 70th week completely and perfectly. Why? Because he is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He is the Prince that shall come. He is Messiah the Prince. He is everlasting life, reconciliation with God, restitution for iniquity, the whole lot. And how is it that even one Christian in this world looks forward to a future 70th week of Daniel? Only heaven knows. But I'm going to expose this lie if it's the last thing I do. As long as God gives me breath... And I'll accept any criticism, any threat of life, anything that, the, that the, the hell of this world can dream up for me. I'm going to tell the truth. Back to you, Yerk. Well, Tom, thankfully you do. But uh, since you already took a little journey into Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, which is later, of course, on our program to do so, I would like to return to one other thing that you said, and I think that needs a little bit more 
uh, to be studied into. When we go back into verse 24 in Daniel chapter 9, as you see here on your screen on your right side, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. And we already spoke about verse 24. We spoke about verse 25. We are now in verse 26. But the point is, in verse 26, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. You then said, and I don't have the quote from the Bible right here, I have to look that up, otherwise on the internet while we are doing this reading, uh, it is in the, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus said, go not into the way of the Gentiles. Go not to the city of the Samaritans and do not go to the Gentiles. The time needs to be fulfilled first. So he very clearly said that Daniel's vision, Daniel's prophecy of chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, especially verse 24, says, stipulates, this is for thy people, the people of Daniel, and thy holy city, the city of the holy people, meaning uh, the Jews in that time. Meaning Jerusalem. So, meaning Jerusalem. So Jesus came to bring the gospel to them. That's also why in verse 27 he says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many. People often ask me, Jörg, but who are the many? Well, the many are those Jews who accepted him at that time. Many other Jews rejected them and said he was not the Messiah, but he confirmed the covenant with many. He confirmed the covenant with Israel, with true believers, for one week in that time in the very last week of the 70-week prophecy. My point that I want to go into and that Tom can elaborate a little bit better on afterwards, after I did my saying here, is if verse 24 so clearly states that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and Jerusalem, thy holy city, to finish the transgression, that means that Jesus came to bring the gospel to the Jews. And that Afterwards, we are told that the gospel went to the Gentiles. But if that is true, if Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 only deals with the Jews, how come we Gentiles today have the gospel if the 70th week is still future? That is a question that needs to be answered. And I, I'm not allowed to take wagers or something. <laughs> but I'm very sure that when you, next time you go to your church, whether it's a Methodist church, it's a Lutheran church, it's a Baptist church, it's a Seventh-day Adventist church maybe even, I don't care what denomination you go to, and you ask them, is Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 meant for the Jews or for the whole world, you have to listen to the answer of your pastor. And you have to ask him if Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 and 27 uh, through 27 deals with the Jews in Babylonian captivity at that time, means the whole nation of Israel, of Jews at that time, how come that if the 70th week is not fulfilled, we Gentiles already have the gospel. That needs some explanation, don't you think so, Tom? Well, yes, I do. And and this is this is a question for your listeners to answer because it's the listeners that we're most concerned with. Absolutely. The the very reason the the very explanation why the G, the Gentiles are now spreading the gospel all over the world and the Jews still reject the gospel is because the 70th week of Daniel is over. The gospel was never to be given to the Gentiles until the end of that 70th and final week. When you read Daniel's prophecy, you can come to no other conclusion. It doesn't allow the Gentiles to be given uh, the gospel until after the time up appointed by Daniel. The 70th and final week is to be over. And 
Historically, that's exactly the way it happened. Now we understand why Jesus forbid the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles. The apostles, the disciples were forbidden to go into the way of the Gentiles until the prophecy was fulfilled. Until Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled. Daniel's prophecy for the Jews, Daniel's people, and Jerusalem. And that was that was concluded three and a half years after Christ's crucifixion. That was when the Sanhedrin of Israel rejected the gospel that Stephen brought to them. And they stoned him. Rather than repenting of their wickedness, repenting of their rebellion, repenting of their sin and their self-righteousness and their animal sacrifices that can never take away sins, and all their oblations and all this outward religiosity that was just demonstrated on top of that mountain, if they had only just gotten on their knees and accepted the sacrifice that Jesus made once and for all, for all the Jews and the Gentiles, you say he confirmed the covenant with many, many Jews. He confirmed that covenant for me, a Gentile, 2,000 years later. That's why it says many. Yeah, what I should have said to him is Israelites, because we are speaking of Israel in the spirit, not Israel, the country that is today in Palestine that you mentioned before. We are speaking of the spiritual Israel, and this is why I have already since 20 minutes this picture on the screen that we are saved by grace through faith. In the Old Testament as in the New Testament. And we are Israelites by faith and not by flesh. That is, that means, sorry, sorry, that means circumcision of the heart, right? That's right. The covenant which he gave to the Jews, he also gave to the Gentiles. There is no second covenant. There's the self same salvation for the Jew as there is for the Gentile. And Christians would have you believe today that we're saved by grace through faith and the Jews are saved by animal sacrifices. This is exactly why the papacy told the whole Christian world it's not necessary to evangelize Jews. Why? He didn't answer that question because it would have awakened some of the Protestant sentiment in this country. But if the Pope would have answered that question, he would have said, because the Jews are saved by animal sacrifices. Because that's what he wants on Temple Mount, animal sacrifices, so that his man of sin that he's conjured up out of nothing can cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease and deceive the whole world. To make it the field wide open so he can ride into Jerusalem on the colt, the foal of an ass, and declare himself to be the Messiah. That's exactly what the history is going to prove. The I'm Pope going to be have, proven right about this in history. The Pope should have said the Jews have their own sacrifice. That's right. We have the sacrifice of Jesus, and they have their own sacrifice. The problem is the Pope cannot even say that he has the sacrifice of Jesus because he sacrificed Jesus all over again in all his churches thousands of times every day in the Mass, and it's called the dogma of transubstantiation with the Eucharist. If you've heard me once say it, you've heard me say it a thousand times. I've said it so many times it's become cliche. The papacy wants the Jews to eat and drink damnation to themselves as they do themselves and the same thing to themselves and to the gentile christians of every denomination they're now preaching in the protestant and evangelical churches that what takes place on the communion table is a sacrifice they've started by calling it the eucharist that is a roman catholic term that relates only to the roman catholic sacrifice of the mass all the Protestant, all the futurist churches are now becoming Roman Catholic churches. And their pastors are leading them lock, stock, and barrel right down the primrose path to perdition. The Protestant and evangelical churches no longer protest the papacy. They consider the Roman Catholic Church, strange though it is, pedophilia as it is, 
that it is a Christian church and there ought to be peace and unity with all the, all the Christian churches, and they're standardizing their form of worship. All of a sudden, just like the Lutherans do, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, all the other denominational uh, uh, sects of, of uh, the Christian church are now beginning to call the bread and the wine of the, uh, of the communion table the Eucharist. That's just one drop in the bucket. First thing you know, they'll begin to call it a sacrifice. And let me tell you, there is one infallible way to identify a diabolical church. And that's if they make sacrifice. Any church that makes a sacrifice like the Mass or like the Jews on Temple Mount in Jerusalem will eat and drink damnation to themselves because Jesus, the fulfillment of the 70th and final week of Daniel 2,000 years ago, said, I will cause the sacrifices and the oblations to cease. And that's exactly what he did. He said, it is finished, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, thus putting a permanent end to all sacrifices. And in case anybody had the shrewd idea of waiting until Jesus was gone and then sew that veil back up <coughs> and begin to make animal sacrifices again, 40 years later, the Messiah, the Prince, the Prince that shall come, he sent his people, the Romans, to destroy that temple. Not one stone remained upon the other. There was no veil left to sew back together. There was no Holy of Holies. There was no Ark of the Covenant. And the priesthood had all been, been either, uh, either converted to true Christianity or they were killed by the Roman Legion, the 10th Roman Legion. There was no one left to offer an animal sacrifice or oblation. The sacrifices and oblations have ceased. The Jews have been without a sacrifice or an oblation or even a priest for 2,000 years. But it's Rome who's full of priests, pedophiles though they may be, full of sacrificing priests. And they demand the futurist Protestant and evangelical churches who no longer protest the man of sin in the papacy are going to sanctify their relationship by taking a joint communion on the Roman Catholic altar and thus do just like the Jews, eat and drink a sacrifice and oblation and eat and drink damnation to themselves, thereby rejecting the sacrifice that Christ made for them 2,000 years ago. Satan's got us all going the same direction, his direction, straight to the pit. And you've got a decision to make. If you're within the sound of my voice, I don't care if you're male, female, pastor, priest, whatever, you've got a decision to make. Are you going to follow this abomination? Or are you going to put your faith, hope, and trust in the sacrifice that was made for you 2,000 years ago? That's a choice. You either believe in the grace of Almighty God by faith in his gospel and his blood and take it for face value or you eat and drink damnation to yourself in a forbidden sacrifice. That's what it's all about. And how easy God's people are led astray. Even the quote-unquote very elect of God. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, it took us some time, but I think we established that Isaiah 53, verse 8, is absolutely speaking about Jesus Christ, right? Absolutely. He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, and those are the same my people which are called in Daniel chapter 9, uh, chapter 9 verse 24, thy people. Yeah? That's right. My people, thy people, exactly the same. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. They did the crime, he paid it all. 
If no, I but, hit stripes, I am healed. Exactly. Now, we have a question here. Who are the people of the prince that shall come, that shall destroy the city and the sanctuary? And who is the prince? Yeah, you know, we remember, we read about this in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Tom already went into that a little bit, but now we are going to answer this question. The point is, this will be an explanation that will surprise you. Now, please listen careful to what we have to say in that regard. Question. What desolations are determined? Answer. Jesus warned of desolations when Jews rejected him. And the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was the highest form of rejection I think you can show, right? Matthew 23:37 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. Remember Stephen, right? How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. The next verse. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And Tom already went into that. He said that the prince... Of the people that should come, or the people of the prince that shall come, that prince is Jesus Christ. He sent the Gentile Roman army in 70 AD to destroy the temple and the city. And that's why Jesus, when he was on the cross, said it was finished, and God has left the temple, showed that by ripping the tail from top to bottom in twain. He left their house unto them desolate. It is an empty house. You could do nothing anymore. You could not do any sacrifices anymore with the, with, the, with the veil rent from top to bottom. You couldn't do any sacrifices anymore because Jesus Christ was the one and only sacrifice that ever only was accepted by God in heaven. No other sacrifice ever was accepted. Because, I show the picture again, even in the Old Testament, people were not saved by cutting the throat of sheep and doves and bulls and goats and whatever animals that were clean and brought to the altar and then burned. But they were saved by faith, as we are saved by faith. Faith in the same one sacrifice and for all, the only sacrifice the Father ever accepted the sacrifice of his own and only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Your house is left unto you desolate. Why in the world would you go start building a new house? That's right. It is left unto you desolate 2,000 years ago. It is left unto exactly. you desolate today. They built an empty house. That's right. That is absolutely correct. If they build a house on that mountain, it will be an empty house. God and the glory of God will not stand over any portion of that house. Jesus will never enter that house. For God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. The next part of the New Testament we read in Mark chapter 15 verses 36 through 39. And one ran and filled the sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he cried, that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was 
the Son of God. Here we have proof that at the moment when Jesus gave up the ghost, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Your house is left unto you desolate, right at that moment. Isn't that a wonderful confirmation of a Jesus absolutely. Christ being the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9? Absolutely. It's a stunning revelation. It is as if God was saying, no more sacrifices, no more oblations. My son paid it all. That's why God ripped the, temp the veil of the temple. Because Daniel prophesied that Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. That he would put an end of sin. Make complete reconciliation between God and man. Thus putting an end to a permanent end of sacrifice and oblation. Make complete that's reconciliation. Why we know that if there, that's why we know that if any church in this world, whether Roman Catholic, whether Jewish, whether Protestant, whether Evangelical, or whatever church, whether it's Buddhism, Shintoism, or whatever, if they make a sacrifice, they have damned themselves. To make complete reconciliation, Tom, by faith. That's right. Faith if, alone. If you have the faith. You are saved by faith alone. Yeah. In Jesus faith, Christ alone. Faith through grace. Because you only have the faith through the grace of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Oh. The covenant that... God made with mankind through the blood of his only begotten son is for both Jew and Gentile. There's only one covenant to confirm, and it was confirmed before the whole world in front of God's face and man's face, both Jewish and Gentile, in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. It cannot be gainsaid. And this vision that Daniel saw in the ninth chapter, this vision and prophecy that Daniel saw and gave to mankind in chapter 9 is sealed up. It's rolled up like a scroll, and it has seals upon it that no one is to open again except Christ himself. And we find the record of that literally happening in the book of Revelation. But let me tell you, man has prematurely broken the seals on that vision and that prophecy, has unrolled the scroll and tried to rewrite it. It's called futurism, and it'll damn every soul. It's a hideous reality, but there's no other conclusion that can be drawn. The, the vision and the prophecy that Daniel saw that was rolled up like a scroll and sealed with the blood of Christ has now been reopened, and it's called futurism, a 70th week of Daniel yet to be performed in the future. And I'm here to tell you, it is a lie from here to there, from stem to stern, from east to west, from up to down. It's going to condemn you. It's going to have you following that yellow primrose path right to perdition. And every Protestant and evangelical pastor preaches it, almost without exception. All you got to do is walk into a church, any church, walk up to the pastor and ask him the question, is the 70th week of Daniel fulfilled in the, in the future, or is it past? Listen to his answer. He'll tell you future, and that's when you turn around and you walk out. No, you don't walk out. You run out of that church. 
It's a Roman Catholic church. I don't care if it's a Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Church of England, whatever it is. If they say it's a future 70th week of Daniel, they are preparing to destroy your salvation. To get you to eat and drink damnation to yourself. Rome's deceived them all. The man of sin, the son of perdition. In believing in futurism, they've exonerated the papacy. Very few even suspect the papacy to be the man of sin, the son of perdition. Even the best names in historicism who could name you all the fallacies of Romanism, all the 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 the, the uh, uh, doctrinal errors, all the imagery, all the idolatry, all the sinful history of the papacy, all the murders and inquisitions and pedophilia, every sin that Rome has can has committed in the last two hundred year, uh, two thousand years, to turn around around and say that the antichrist, the real antichrist, the final antichrist is future. They're all liars. I've exposed them all. I've done it for 20 years. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. And if you believe otherwise, you'll be deceived. That's all there is to it. You've left the door wide open for your own deception. Back to you, Yerk. And to make sure that you are not deceived, we are doing this study. And we will prove to you in even more verses of the New Testament that Jesus Christ was the complete and utter fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week 2,000 years ago. But we are going into Hebrews chapter 10, Tom. That is a wonderful chapter. And when we study that, we will in many verses in that chapter show that Jesus Christ was the complete and utter fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week 2,000 years ago. But the study of this chapter takes us for 10 pages. And when that is done, we go into verse 27 of Daniel chapter 9, even though we spoke about that already, but we are going to dissect that as we did with verse 24, 25, and today with 26. And next time we will go into Hebrews 10 first, because I don't think it is any avail for us at being close at an hour now to start Hebrews chapter 10. We are going to prepare ourselves for that reading, Tom and me, and you can do the same. And then next time we will come together and we will read Hebrews chapter 10 in the understanding and the teaching that Jesus Christ was the utter fulfillment, the complete fulfillment of Daniel's Prophecy, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Because of the time so much advanced, Tom, I don't want to start with that anymore. And that also gives us some time to better prepare for next time when we come together next week in this reading. And therefore, I want to leave the closing remarks to you, brother. Well, I hope the listeners can understand my passion. Those who expect me to speak in uh, conversational tones about this would expect me not to scream bloody murder if I was about to be run over by a locomotive. I cannot speak about something as serious as this in just plain old conversational tones. I don't know how anybody can. But my salutation to the listeners then is I bid you peace in the name of the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the fulfillment, the perfect and complete fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. May you enjoy the peace and reconciliation with God that he paid for with his own blood that puts an end of sin, makes reconciliation for iniquity, brings in everlasting righteousness, a kingdom that will never end, that is present in the world today. Though invisible, it's present in the world today, and many are part of it. Exalt 
Let's all sing together.